God's mission, my mission. I'd like to share and read for you a statement, another statement that our World Church has uh, published here, the Ministerial Association. And here's that statement. It says, the head directs the body and the head of the church body is Christ. Uh, we hear that in Colossians 1 verse 18. The body is an extension of his will. Now here's what we're leaning into today and for the next three sermons, and this is a bit of a challenge. It says, it, the church, does on earth what he would do if he were here. Amen. The church is nothing other than an extension of his will. The church is not the church until the church is doing what he would do were he here. And so what does it really mean for Jesus to be the head of our church? What does it mean for this movement to be an extension of his will? And you see, the reason I'm asking these questions today is that as we read through the Bible, there is a sobering reality. In fact, I'll call it a sobering irony that becomes evident. It is an irony that in a particular sense comes to a climax in the gospel accounts in the New Testament. I think one of the clearest and most succinct descriptions of this irony comes from something that the evangelist John said in one statement. John says this, he, the word made flesh, he, the one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, he, God himself with us, he came to his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. Talking about the scene that comes to a climax as we read through the scriptures and especially in a particular way through the gospels and by his own, John was not speaking in the universal sense because indeed the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and everyone who dwells therein. John, by saying his own, was referring to those who were called out, those who were chosen in the midst of the darkness of sin to represent God's heart and God's mission to the world. Those who were to shine like lights in the darkness of the world, those who were to be the extension of his will on earth. Yes, the one upon whose name we say our church is built is one who was seen by the people of the book as a disturbance to the church of his day, as a threat to their place in society, as an embarrassment to the witness they sought to uphold. They saw this Jesus, that is the head of the church, as a disrespect to the traditions of the elders. Sobering irony. I don't know if you've read it. And by the way, this, this is not just a theme limited to the time of Scripture, to the historical time of Scripture, because the same John that wrote this in the Gospel account, he was shown messages to be given to seven churches in Asia, and we have thankfully had those messages preserved in our Bibles in the last book of the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, one of the things that becomes clear as we read these messages is that, yes, they were written to seven literal churches in the area of Asia, but they were also representative of seven eras of time from John's day all the way to the end of time. And the last church there in the city of Laodicea, but also representing our time, is described, man, described in a way that reveals the same irony of rejection 
as our deepest tragedy. The church in the last days is deceived in its self-sufficiency. And Jesus is pictured on the outside seeking to get in. There it is, Laodicean message. Behold, I stand where? He's on the, at the door and he's knocking. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. We'll dine with him and he with me. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Jesus is on the outside not because the people aren't religious enough, but because they think their religiosity is enough. Jesus is on the outside not because they stopped going to church, not because they stopped being faithful in going to church, but because they stopped being faithful in being the church. In the last days, the church tends toward deceptive satisfaction with itself and ironic indifference to the mission of its professed head. It is said that a man is known by the company he keeps. <laughs> I grew up hearing it this way. My dad used to tell me this one all the time. He said, son, here's a saying you should never forget. Show me your friends. You know what, Elder Barrow? And I'll tell you who you are. Show me your friends and I will tell you who you are. But I want you to sit that comment in a different and more challenging space right now. Because as we read the Bible concerning the earthly ministry of Jesus and honestly compare his mission uh, to the tendencies and preferences of our time, we may safely conclude that Jesus would not actually be the best fit for most churches today. After all, we can't risk chasing away the influential members of our church. What about our neighborhood? We can't risk getting the cold shoulder from our neighborhood on account of these riffraffs that, that tend to follow Jesus. Maybe a more appropriate thing to do today would be to kindly give Jesus a ministry across town somewhere where those kinds of people tend to congregate, where those kinds of people tend to be tolerated because a man is known by the company he keeps. And if this Jesus is the head of your church, then your church is engulfed in the same reputation. Can we afford that? This is actually not just abstract imagination, folks. Because the truth be told, just like the people in, in his day, we today continue to have our expectations of Jesus. There is that popular saying, right? What would Jesus do? But I want to put it to you today that as we say that, what we are probably more inclined to ask is, what should Jesus do? Because that question puts us in charge of creating a Jesus to our liking. Huh? The things that should bring joy to Jesus' heart, the things that should please him the most, the, the kinds of places he should go, the kinds of people he should hang out with, the, the, the kinds of gatherings he should find acceptable, the parameters that he himself should not cross. What should my Jesus do? That's often the question we're answering when we ask, what would Jesus do? The Pharisees and teachers of the law had their list of expectations. They, like us, were people of the book. Don't go criticizing the Pharisees too quickly. They, these were good people. And they were people of the book. 
These were people steeped in the prophecies of Daniel and Isaiah. They had their expectations of what the Messiah would do and what he would be like and when he would come and what that would look like and how events would unfold. There was a certain level of liberation and vindication and exaltation that the chosen people should be favored with when the Messiah showed up. There was a certain sound of heavenly celebration that they expected to hear in that day. A celebration specifically inspired by the faithful track record of those who stayed true to the traditions. Of course, the tragic shadow side of this expectation was that they now trusted in themselves and in their abilities to carry out these sacred laws and these sacred traditions. They trusted themselves and they were righteous in their own skin and they viewed everybody else with contempt. Listen to a prayer recorded that the Pharisees would authentically and sincerely pray, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, this is the New American Standard Bible, or even like this tax collector. Hey, I fast twice a week. Yeah. I pay tithes of all that I get. <laughs> you can just kind of hear in this prayer and just imagine the celebration that the Pharisees thought must be sparked in heaven because of the stalwart report in my prayer. Man, heaven must be kicked into a, a high notch of celebration right now. Look at all the things I can say about what I'm doing over and against those people. Heaven must be having a party right now because of my faithfulness. <laughs> Since they thought these works of theirs brought heaven the most joy, then these works brought them the most fulfillment. And they expected the Messiah, if he was truly from God, if he was truly from God, to celebrate and affirm these things. Then Jesus shows up. And having aroused the curiosity of the religious leaders with this kingdom-establishing announcement, his presence and his actions began to confuse them. You see, he started hanging out with the wrong crowd. That's not the kind of people you get to hang around and maintain your reputation as a religious leader, let alone the Messiah. The, there is this line that got drawn, a very clear line that got drawn between the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes on one hand and the tax collectors and sinners on the other hand. And these two groups had nothing to do with each other. Yet we notice in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus crosses this divide. And guess what? He even calls a tax collector to be one of his disciples. And the tax collector goes and talks to all the rest of his tax collector friends. And, and they host a great feast for Jesus in their house. And Jesus is the guest of honor. And here's how verse 30 picks up of, of Luke chapter 5. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Here's the New Living Translation. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? You're not supposed to be showing up about, around these people. Blinded by selfish tradition, they failed to see spiritual strategy. 
Jump with me to Luke chapter 7. Now Jesus has gone to the home of a Pharisee to eat. Because he's not just on one side or the other. He was with the tax collector. Now, now he goes and eats with the Pharisee. But watch this. When a certain what? Immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there. Jesus was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And there's something about when you know where God has brought you from. But watch this with me. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, if he is who he claims to be, if he came, for, if he's inspired by heaven's joys, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. And it only gets worse. You continue reading through. I'm telling you, the Gospels have this theme going throughout. And as, 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 as you build up, I'm in, I'm in Luke's account, as we build up through his writings, it only gets worse and worse by the time you get to Luke chapter 15. Man, it's, the, it's exactly the floodgates the Pharisees were predicting. It's no longer one sinful woman over there in that house or some few tax collectors over here in this other house. Now, it's a whole bunch of these, these, these scoundrels flocking to Jesus, attracted to Jesus wherever he goes. This is where we're going to be parked for our three-part series in Luke chapter 15. If you're watching the Pew Bibles here, that's page 778. Here's how Luke 15 begins. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all, <laughs> were all gathering around to hear Jesus. <laughs> but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, grumbled, complained, bickered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Did you all read that statement? <laughs> there are some preaching traditions where the preacher would say, man, they just missed their shout. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They're telling the truth. But the truth did not do for them what it should have. <laughs> this is a message of hope. Amen. Coming out of their lips, but somehow marred by hearts of pride, so that the news now took the form of a lament. But this truth was not to be a reason for complaint. This truth was to be a cause for celebration. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. <laughs> but when we are dishonest with ourselves about ourselves, even the truth flying out of our lips does not do for us what it should. I mean, here's a good example of the need to worship both in spirit and truth. As Elder Jack said last week, to worship with our whole passion, with all of who we are. The Pharisees spoke the truth in this moment, but tragically it evoked in them the wrong spirit. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Man, I can't think of a better theme of excitement to be on my lips as I witness to the goodness of God in this neighborhood. This man has time for sinners. This man has made space for those who have fallen by the wayside. This man wants to be with 
people like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. This man welcomes sinners. This man eats with sinners. Somehow they got so locked into their own concept of themselves that even the truth came out as a reason to separate themselves and to exalt themselves and to complain against heaven's highest joy. So in the hearing of all present, scribes, Pharisees, tax collectors, sinners, Jesus gives a three-part response to this complaint. And these are the three parables that we're going to look at together over the next three sermons. Just for the last few moments here, we're going to look at the first one. It's often called the parable of the lost sheep. Then Jesus told them this parable, New International Version, again, page 778, if you want to follow along in the paper version. Suppose one of you has, how many? <laughs> They're doing good. A hundred sheep and loses how many? One of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep for how long? Until he finds it. And when he finds it, here it is, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Doesn't only do that, then he calls his friends. <laughs> and he says, neighbors, hey, hey, together it says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And here's the title of our series. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner. How many? Come on, church. One sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. Y'all remember what Laodicea was told? Here's what we say of ourselves. We don't need anything. We have need of nothing. We're good. We're in a position that heaven must be set. Man, heaven's got to be lucky to have us on their team. And Jesus says, man, there's going to be more joy in heaven over one sinner who recognizes his need, recognizes her need, turns around, repents, and is found. So Jesus answers by inviting his listeners into a scenario and requiring of them a choice. Say you have 100 sheep and one gets lost, what would you do? That's that, I like how Jesus teaches. He invites them into this thought process. What would you do in this scenario? Parable. This truth that comes alongside you in the form of a story. Moment of decision. But work with me, church. I don't know how you think. I mean, I know, I know in, in this culture of, of, of personal gain um, that, I've, that I've grown up in and, and I've grown accustomed to, you know, from a selfish standpoint, <laughs> listen, man, one got lost. What would you do? <laughs> At least you still have how many? <laughs> You're in a good place, folks. You've only lost one. At least you still have 99 with you. The single lost sheep is not that big a deal. But Jesus uses the kind of example that, for one, pulls people, and don't miss this church, pulls people's hearts toward the vulnerable. You see, the 99 sheep have each other. That single lost sheep has no one. In case of an attack, y'all know how sheep operate? The 99 can look out for one another. The 99 can press together. 
The 99 can warn each other. The 99 can run together. The 99 can interchange between being on the outer edge and being on the protected inside. But the lone sheep must fend for itself. A single lost sheep would almost certainly be devoured. Can I make a a point of application for our church to consider today? I believe as we seek to determine what what it truly means to have Jesus as the head of our church. Now, I've grown up in communities of faith, and I'm thankful for it. But it occurs to me that the posture of church life today is far too often toward the comfortable and not toward the vulnerable. It often rises to the top in the way we plan and the way we strategize, the way we budget and the way we we prioritize. How do we keep those who feel settled in their faith comfortable, satisfied? Forget the vulnerable. The The vulnerable people are those flaky people anyway who aren't contributing to the tithe of our church. The vulnerable are those who like to question everything and won't just take my word for it. The vulnerable are those who don't find the same safety in our customs as those who are comfortable do. The vulnerable are those who are ultimately off in search of other green pastures. But the comfortable... Ah, the comfortable. It is easier to define your success among the comfortable. It requires less out-of-the-box thinking to plan for the comfortable. It is, it, is, it, is, it is far less convincing. It is far less to convince that our stability depends on the comfortable majority. I mean, it only seems logical, not just for sheep, But for literally the church to why shift your focus from the 99 that you have to the one that you don't have? Why strategize and prioritize for any other reason than for the comfortable that you already have? I've pastored in environments where multiple churches were nearby each other. I get to understand that the greater Seattle area is much the same. And it just seems to me that sometimes one of those mindsets that, 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 that helps us to recognize this comfortable thing is that we choose churches based on what preferences something changed. 
That's all right. Thank you so much. Hey, I appreciate the AV team and their willingness to support in times like this and in times that are comfortable. You know, they're there, whether it's... Co Look, I, I used to work in AV, man. This was my ministry in church, and my hat's off to the team. Thank you so much for your quick support and help there. What I was mentioning a while ago is this. The, sh the lost sheep will be found either way. There is an urgency here because the lost sheep will be found. If not by the shepherd, it will be found by a predator. So while the Pharisees try to guard their perceived reputations and protect their circles of thought, Jesus pursues a different rescue mission. Speaking into the much deeper conflict between good and evil, the devil as a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy, but Jesus as the good shepherd seeking whom he may rescue and restore. So he, Jesus, the center of our church goes with urgency as a shepherd would to find and recover the lost sheep. Man, even water? I appreciate you, man. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. This is, we, we praise God. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my brother. He goes with urgency. And as you read this passage, it, 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 it's a language of determination. You, you heard it there. He keeps on searching until he finds it. I don't know if you know anyone who's ever walked away from the faith. I know a few. I've grown up with a few. There are many who have walked away from the faith. And sometimes you and I are a little bit too quick to consign them to the devil. Oh, that's a lost cause. Oh, that's a hopeless case. Jesus asks, won't the shepherd search until he finds it? Jesus doesn't give up as easily as I do. But let's backtrack just a little bit here to explore a second point because I believe that part of the mystery of the gospel and part of the urgency of his mission revealed in this parable is in the first phrase of the shepherd scene. Remember, Luke has described, Luke has described that what was known in his society was two distinct groups. We talked about it, the, the Pharisees and the scribes on the one side and, and the tax collectors and sinners on the other side. And Jesus boldly compares everybody Scribes, Pharisees, tax collectors, and sinners to the same flock. In this scenario, the tax collectors and sinners are not some goats that eventually get converted to be sheep. Yes, they are lost at the moment, but they are lost sheep. Sheep belonging to the same shepherd. Man, see, one of the transforming uh, things about the gospel that, that heaven longs to celebrate is that it gives us a renewed lens through which to see ourselves and to see those people around us. It's a lens that transcends any dividing class. The gospel invites us to see ourselves and that stranger as fellow sheep belonging to the same shepherd. The gospel invites us to view ourselves and that outsider as fellow sheep belonging to the same shepherd. And when the world seeks to categorize and separate and define us according to this and that and the other, the mystery of the gospel revealed reminds us that in Christ, the two groups have been made into one. And the dividing wall between them has been broken down. So that first means that you and I, regardless of physical lineage, are included as fellow heirs of God's promise by faith in Jesus Christ. But that also means that those around us, different as they may be, are also to be seen as fellow sheep belonging to the same shepherd. 
Living the kingdom life means understanding these worldly divisions to be superficial at best and destructive at worst, for we are one in Christ. The common denominator at the beginning of Luke 15 is Jesus. They all came to Jesus, scribes, Pharisees, tax collectors, sinners, they all came to Jesus. Mind you, some of them came to hear a word of hope. Others came to judge the preacher. But they all came to Jesus. Some came with their broken lives. Others came with their pomp and pride. But they all came to Jesus. It was a mixed crowd. But in that moment, because of Jesus, they were all invited to consider themselves fellow sheep belonging to the same shepherd. And Jesus then speaks of the recovery and of the rejoicing. You saw it before. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. As we focus on that last part for just the last portion of our sermon today, it is apparent to me that this came as a disappointment to the self-righteous ones in the crowd who thought that their pious expressions of faith inspired heaven's greatest joys. If I fast twice a week, if I give a tenth of all I own, if I show up faithfully to the church Sabbath after Sabbath. Come what may, I can just imagine how heaven is rejoicing. And Jesus says, I'll tell you when the celebration really gets going in heaven. When your course is changed. When your heart turns away from sin when the trajectory of your life is no longer set by the dominion of darkness, when someone's life is rescued and transformed, transferred from the darkness of deception to the light of truth as it is in Jesus, that's when heaven kicks into celebration mode because that is heaven's goal. That is heaven's goal. But once again, the irony, that which brings the most joy in heaven is oftentimes the very thing that brings the most concern to earthly religious motivations. Read it again. Jesus was rescuing sinners and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining about it. The moment of Jesus' ministry that caused the loudest celebrations in heaven were the moments that caused the greatest consternation in the church. Now, if that's not a tragedy of cosmic proportions, tell me what is. God and his people on two different wavelengths of mission. The church is often more concerned with maintaining the neatness of its traditions and the purity of its reputation than about doing whatever it takes to lift up Jesus, the one who really makes the difference and will pursue you until you are found in him. What is it that I hear from place to place? 
I'd much rather be known as a church that doesn't do this. I'd much rather be known as a church that only does this. I'm, I don't know if, it's, if, if music is a thing for you. I love music, so I'm going to hit some of those examples. I much rather be, I am proud to know I'm a church that only sings hymns. I am proud to know that I'm a church with a reputation that only sings contemporary praise and worship. I am proud to know that I'm a church that only uses this kind of instrument and never uses that kind of, I am proud to know that I have this stance on, on sports or, or, I don't know, on cheese or, I, I don't know, I'm, than to be known as the church that will do whatever it takes to seek out the lost and point them to Jesus. We don't have to guess what his mission was. As our head and us as the extension of his will, we don't have to guess what his will was or is. He has made it abundantly clear and we can sift through all the distracting hills that we've made as people of faith and, and these religious soapboxes. We can sift through them and say, man, I, I, I know what it is. He's made it clear that his mission is to seek and to save the lost. So my question to us today is, What's our mission? What's the thing that moves us? What's the thing that makes us proud of who we are? What's the thing that defines the Renton church in the Renton community? What does it mean to be an extension of his will? Jesus, the center of our church, has something to say about that. John 20, verse 21. <laughs> As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Whatever you saw Jesus up to, the Father sent him to do it. And he says, the thing that the Father sent me to do, I'm sending the real church out there to do that. That's what it is. If Jesus is truly the head of this church, then everything we are as a church, everything we do as a church must be based on and built upon what was established by Jesus Christ. Man, let me tell you, I'm not, I'm not in anybody's way. We can be anything we want to be. We can be any group we want to be, but when we call ourselves the church, in order not to take the name of the Lord in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. In order to hold this name, to bear this name, I am Christian. Or as in the book of Acts, the way they were called, followers of the way. Right? In order to be people not taking this name in vain, not taking this name lightly, we must recognize his mission as our sole guiding principle. His joy as the goal to be reached. His passion as our fuel. His pursuit as our path. The head of the body is Christ, so that this movement is an extension of his will. In other words, we are doing on earth whatever he would do if he was here. What drives you as a church? What drives you? What, what gets you passionate? What, what builds that fire inside your bones? I know I've been on all kinds of hills in my short life so far. I know that I've been driven by the wrong things sometimes. I know I've shown up to church with the wrong fire in my bones sometimes. I know I've shown up just to make sure that things were done my way. And I will do whatever it takes 
to make sure that my voice is heard and that my opinion holds sway and that my way is the church's way. It's not just me. Even the early church. Man. Book of Acts. Factions in the church. Basically the entire New Testament after the Gospels is committed to healing these factions that have grown in the church. Hey, stop the bickering. Stop the fussing. Stop making a hill. Stop saying, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of, I'm of Paul. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. This ministry that says, look, it's not me versus them, but we are all sheep of the same fold belonging to the same shepherd. And the shepherd's mission is to do whatever it takes for the lost sheep to be found. So if I'm on his side, I'm going to do whatever it takes. If I'm on his side, my voice isn't the most important voice. It's the voice of the shepherd. Says, my sheep know my voice. And they follow me. What drives you, church? I want to appeal to somebody today. Just before I take my seat. Wherever you find yourself. First, I want to talk to those who find yourself with that one lost sheep. Understand today that our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is doing whatever it takes. He's already shown that to us on the cross. He will go to the ends of the earth just for you just for you. If the rest of the world represented the 99 and it was just you, he would die on that cross. So turn to him. Be found in him. Accept him as your Lord, as your Savior, as your shepherd. I want to appeal to the 99 now. Anybody here who recognizes yourself among the 99, rejoice in the safety of the 99. Rejoice in being settled in the inheritance that God has in store for us. Rejoice in what brings heaven joy. And be sure to celebrate what God is doing for the lost. That's not a message of complaint. That's not something to bicker about. God, Jesus is pulling out the stops and people are coming to him and, and salvation is being made available to all the earth. This is news for rejoicing. This man hangs out with sinners and eats with them. So 99, go with him. One, be found in him. Father, we are just starting a fresh look at these three parables. Now, you, you had to pull out the stops and explain in detail. There had to be three parables just to cut through, cut through the hardened complaint that was actually supposed to be good news. Help us to understand and not just to hear. Help us to be moved by what moves you. Help us to be led by your mission for our community and for the world. Let all God's people say, Amen.